Welcome to our worship from Seal Church, led by me, Canon Anne Labar. The hymn which ends the service is sung by the choristers of St Martin in the Fields. At the beginning of our worship in church on the four Sundays of Advent, we light candles, one more each Sunday, until Christmas Day, when we light a fifth candle, which reminds us of the birth of the light of the world. For our online worship during Advent, you might like to find five candles of your own and light them one by one each Sunday too, or just a single candle to light each week as we begin our worship. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light now in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, that on the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64, beginning at the first verse. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity for ever. Now consider, we are all your people. The Gospel reading today is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning at verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, In those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, 
and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. A few weeks ago, when the Prime Minister reshuffled his cabinet, there was quite a bit of hoo-ha about his new Minister Without Portfolio, Esther McVeigh. In a supposedly off-the-record briefing to the Sun newspaper, a nameless Whitehall insider described her as the Minister for Common Sense and said she'd been brought in to advance the government's anti-woke agenda. They plainly assumed that being anti-woke would be a vote winner, at least with the Sun's readership. Woke is a word that's become very loaded in recent years. It's often used as an insult, said with a sneer. For Christians, though, wherever we stand politically, this negativity about wokeness poses a bit of a problem because in today's Gospel reading, Jesus tells us very clearly and urgently that we should stay awake. And it's probably this passage which gave rise to the slogan, Stay Woke, in the first place. It's a slogan that's been in use in the black American community as far back as the 1920s, a community, of course, that was historically steeped in the scriptures. And it has a double meaning. It was partly a warning to be aware of the danger you might be in if a white person thought you'd stepped out of line. You had to stay woke, be vigilant to what they might be thinking. But staying woke was also about being aware that to be treated like this wasn't okay. If discrimination is embedded in society, people often don't see it or name it just as a fish isn't aware of the water it swims in. If you're on the receiving end of prejudice constantly, it's really easy to internalise it, to start thinking it's your fault, or that it's just the way things are. And that's true not just of racism, but of any kind of injustice. History is littered with things we now look back on with horror. How can people have thought that slavery was a good thing? And yet they did. How can people have thought that women weren't capable of voting? And yet they did. How can people have thought it was OK to send children up chimneys to clean them, or down mines to haul coal trucks? And yet they did. And of course, in many parts of the world, these things are still happening. Here in 21st century Western Europe, though, we look back at these things now and we ask, how could people have thought that was OK? But I wonder how history will judge us. What are we closing our eyes to that future generations will be staggered at? Overconsumption? Environmental degradation? Global inequality? Who knows? It's the stuff we aren't seeing that's the problem. Staying woke waking up, 
means opening our eyes to whatever damages God's creation, that includes ourselves, taking it seriously. But on its own, that's not enough. In fact, on its own, it can be profoundly dangerous. If we only wake up to the problems, we'll end up chronically anxious, depressed, swamped by hopelessness. Perhaps you feel like that already. One reason why we can't bear to look at what's in front of our eyes is that we don't think we can do anything about it. It's too big, too complicated, too overwhelming for finite, frail, flawed human beings like us. And actually, we're right to think that. It really is too big, too complicated, too overwhelming. That's why Jesus tells us in this gospel passage that we also need to stay awake to keep our eyes open for the coming of God to us, for that moment when God shows up in our midst. This is really the point of this passage. Those ways may be small ways, as small as the budding of leaves on a fig tree, but they make all the difference. Jesus' words here are meant to be words of encouragement not discouragement. Yes, stay awake to the needs of the world, he says, because it's there in the need that you'll find God coming to meet it. Stay awake to the sorrow, because it's there you'll find his joy. Stay awake to the brokenness, because it's there you'll find his healing. The prophet Isaiah calls on God in words that I'm sure we can echo, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Pull your finger out, God. Where are you? But by the end of the passage, Isaiah has come to realise that God was there all the time. What felt like his absence was really the effect of his people turning away, forgetting to look for him, closing their eyes and falling asleep to him. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, he says. Well, no wonder they weren't finding him. They weren't looking for him. But despite that, as he says in the end, we are all your people. That was always true. They just needed to realise it, to remember it. For Christians, of course, the ultimate way in which God shows up in our midst, the ultimate way in which we can know him, is in Christ. Where are you, God? we cry. Here I am, says Jesus. So how do we wake up to Jesus, Emmanuel, the God who is with us? Well, Isaiah says that you meet those who gladly do right. We can find God as we work for justice and put things right. Habits of prayer matter too, calling on his name. And in the Gospel reading, we're reminded that we don't have to look for God on our own. The doorkeeper in Jesus' parable is part of a household, a community. He has his role to play, his job to do, literally sitting at the door and keeping watch. But others have different roles to play in making sure the household is ready to welcome their master when he returns. We look out for God best, it seems to tell us, when we look out for him in the company of others. Stay woke. That's what Advent calls us to do. Not to close our eyes to the issues we need to address because, of we dis- because we despair of them, but to open our eyes to the presence of God, to his love, which heals and transforms and empowers us. In Advent, and the word means coming, we think about the coming of God in the past, in the baby, in the manger. And we think about the coming of God in the future, looking forward to a time when God will make a new heaven and a new earth, whatever that might mean. But also, and perhaps most importantly, we think about the God who comes to us now, in the present, the God who shows up if we have eyes to see him every day, planting his seeds of love and courage in the hearts of anyone willing to receive them. Am I woke? I sincerely hope so. But if not, my prayer is that God will wake me and all of us up this Advent, that he will wake us up to his glory, 
that he will wake us up to his hope, that he will wake us up to his peace and his joy. Amen. As we bring our prayers to God, so we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, Scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.